hey, I don't know if I'm live yet. I think it is working. I do this every time. It's, I know, and it gets, it gets better each time I go through this. I'm just making a change. I found a really good political, car political cartoon. I like old political cartoons. All right. So. Back to the Cold War, which does directly relate to your DBQ. Oh. Looks like I'm on. Let me know if it's not working. I had to make a couple changes. They did an update to the uh, studio program I've been using. By the way, I now got it where if I could get a green screen, I could do amazing special effects. It's been updated to supposedly make it just seamless special effects. So I could be talking and I'd like lions jump at me. I thought that was a really good idea. Okay, so a couple announcements first off. I'm sure all of you know, and I didn't say it yesterday. I don't know why I was going to, but just making sure this works. Okay. But we are going to continue with this for the rest of the year. We're not going to go back to... So school is not going to open up as it normally does. We're going to go, we're going to continue teaching online for the rest of the year. And uh, it's the right decision. And it would be such a, a, a nightmare in so many ways to try to get school started considering all the issues and what we know about pandemics and flare-ups and the fact that we just know nothing about this current one. But it still makes me sad. It's hard to teach this way. I really don't know uh, how it's working. And, um, you know, don't get me wrong. It's work. We all, it's a job. But at the same time, I, I miss the routine having class and seeing everybody. But we are making this work. And I'm trying to keep some kind of normalcy by having a class, by still doing things I would do in normal in class. It's, it's a little bit harder to, to see. All I see now is a wall and a camera. It is easier than I started walking, but hey, that's, that's the way it is. And so we're just going to have to make do. So my plan is we'll continue to do some thesis training next Monday, 930. It's going to be a group team meeting at all AP students. I'm going to put it up after uh, this. I'm going to start going through the first three pages of the review book. I'll go through everything and that will be Monday's class. And then every day, I'm going to come back to a certain area and do a thesis statement and a brainstorm list and talk about uh, possible essay topics for the DBQ. And that one, I'll be, I'm still going to be moving on with class. We're still going to do the Cold War and things like that. And I'm still going to collect notes. We'll have some kind of little test after the exam. I don't want to worry about it right now. Um, I, you know, I want you to start focusing on the review packets. And we're going to do more stuff with documents and DBQ for assignments next week. So the tests will be after the AP exam. And you have to look on Teams and find all that information I posted from the College Board. You have to look at that, make sure that you've already signed up and you have your password. And May 4th is a practice for the College Board. Please look at that. And those are logistic is issues. Uh, if you're having trouble with your sign up, you have to talk to your counselor. That's something I can't deal with. I can um, um, <laughs> commiserate, but I can't, I can't solve that. You have to talk to your counselor. And Ms. Berg in the counseling office is the one who is giving the, uh, or it, uh, charge coordinating the AP exam, and she's great to work with, and so talk to her. <laughs> I know it sounds horrible, but remember, I have nothing to do actually with the, the actual test taking itself. I can't. And another announcement, the DBQ, I've already, a few people have turned it in, and the ones I've graded so far have been very good. Good context with three or four things. Uh, so everyone, the ones I've graded, I have a solid thesis statement. I'm not getting quotes. Remember, do not quote your documents. Any Yahoo can quote. You have to use evidence from that document to show how it relates to your thesis statement. 
And do not start a sentence with in document one or in document A. Start it with Harry Truman said, or an advertisement in the New York Times, or just simply start talking about it. And then at the end of the sentence, doc A, doc B, whatever it might be. And don't forget for two of them, you must show how. So you must show why that document has its bias, why it does. And that's something, some historical event that's going on that would lead to that bias, their point of view, you know, what about them? So for example, in the practice documents I gave you for on page 522 of the review book, it has Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh's point of view was he was an American first and actually sympathetic to the Nazis. That's his point of view. And so therefore an isolationist to let Germany have a free hand in Europe. And so you need that and remember, base it on facts and not a fact um, that times were bad. No, it must be as specific as you can get. And then you need a couple more examples of outside information. But saying that, the ones I've graded have been very good. And, you know, that's, that's great. And don't forget, the great thing about the review packet, and I'll pass out that last sheet right after this. I had some uh, technical issues. <laughs> they updated my program. Everything just takes a little bit longer because of this. But I'll give you that last sheet. Have that in front of you. So when the moment you start the DBQ on May 14th, or whatever date it is, it's the Wednesday, two weeks from yesterday, you have that packet in front of you. So if the question's on the Industrial Revolution in the 1830s, I'm just throwing something out. You can immediately go to that page and go to that section. You have context, you have information, you have factual information right in front of you. And so then all you have to do is relate the documents to your thesis and that outside information that relates to your answer. All right. So let's get back to this. So we have the beginnings of the Cold War, and I went through the fears of the Soviets had and the fears of the United States. And remember, in political structures, one of the best or worst way, depending on your point of view, but for somebody to maintain control is to convince the people that, that the leader is protecting them from outside threats. So Stalin always portrayed it as, I'm protecting you from the fascists and then the United States. And you're going to see the politics in the United States. Look how evil Stalin is. Look at the purges. Look at the Hitler-Stalin pact. Look at all the things Stalin did. And this would be implied as uh, Soviet aggression. And yeah, there was Soviet aggression. But also, they did take the blunt brunt of the German attack. And they really did want that buffer zone. So we talked about Turkey and Greece, and Stalin actually wasn't in charge of this. But... He actually did everything he could to stifle the Greek revolt, and this is what we had yesterday. But, but we have to get to, I think we quit right here. Truman is going to ask for aid. And we have a conservative Congress that does not want the United States involved. And even though they're rapidly anti-communist, to a conservative foreign policy, they look at it as, why should we help Greece? How does that affect us? But Truman's thinking, if we don't help Britain and Greece and keep out Stalin... That means the United States will be committed to always be in Europe to stop Stalin. Truman is thinking, how do we get out of Europe and let Europe protect itself? But he did it in a way that would turn out to have the exact 180 degree option. Because that newspaper headline in the New York Times tells you exactly what you need. And if you can't read it because it's a little bit blurry, it says, Truman acts to save nations from red rule. Asks $400 million, obviously, in aid... Um, to aid Greece and Turkey. Congress fight likely, but approval is seen. So he asked for 500, 400 million, which was significant then. Today, the way um, government's paying 400 million is almost an accounting year, but back then, 400 million was a lot to aid Greece and Turkey. You notice it said Turkey. There was no major communist revolt in Turkey. There was no communist threat, but let's go back to the map here. Where's my control? Right here, where the little... Oops, I gotta see something real quick. As you can see from that, where are we at, where are we at? Right here. They lumped Turkey in to make it more terrifying. 
implying that Stalin is ready to get the Dardanelles right here and immediately moving in the Mediterranean. And next thing you know, it's Italy's gone and Spain's gone and then Wyoming, just all together. And so we have to stop him here. And so Truman exaggerated Stalin's role in Greece as we turned out Stalin was actually trying to hurt this, but he greatly exaggerated that and then lied about Turkey. He made it seem like there was also a chance that Turkey is about ready to fall. Turkey, a um, brand new democratic republic, which seems it's kind of going the opposite direction now, but, but he exaggerated that and saying that Stalin is about ready to take Turkey and Greece and what's next? We're next. He scared people to death and that's how we did it. He made it clear that if you don't vote for this, you are threatening the United States to attack by Stalin. And people didn't really know what communism was, but Stalin was scary. And don't forget that Red Army. No one wanted to talk about it, but that Red Army beat the Soviets. Or be, sorry, <laughs> that Red Army beat the Nazis. Could we actually handle them? So, there was a growing movement outside of um, outside of this, um, the actual issues in Turkey and Greece about what to do about the Soviet Union and its great power. George Keenan wrote what's called the Long Letter to, he was a Undersecretary of State, wrote it to Truman. Also, he wrote in Foreign Affairs Magazine uh, the same kind of thing. And he laid out the policy of containment. And what he said was the Soviet Union was bent on world domination, on world conquest. And the only way to stop the Soviets, the only way to stop them is to stop them everywhere. They're bent on world domination and they're going to poke and prod everywhere. This map shows it right here where here is an area that like communism is a virus and it's already coming to these areas of northern China and Mongolia. It's um, already here, and it's infecting Turkey and Iran and other places. And then these areas as have been exposed. This should fascinate you. Isn't this a lot like you know, pandemic talk today? That it's a disease. It's not like we're fighting a country, like we're fighting Germany or fighting Japan. It's this thing that infects people and bores its way in and changes people. It is different than a normal threat. So we got to handle it different. Now, what he meant by stopping them everywhere, what Keenan meant is we must prop up democratic republics with a kind of a combination economic system of a very well-regulated capitalism and guarantees for all people to have wealth to show that the Western system was better. That's what he believed. We have to show that the Western system is better than communism. But this looks like, if you read it on the surface, militarily stop them everywhere. So here's this idea of containment floating in the air, and that's what Truman pulled in. Turkey and Greece must be stopped because we have to stop them there and contain communism everywhere. And that would lead to the most important foreign policy move in American history, the Truman Doctrine. And it would be the basis of U.S. foreign policy. I said 70 years when I typed that, over 70 years, to this day. Truman would lay this out, and I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal the Truman Doctrine was. This would change everything. American foreign policy before 1948 would be, or 47, 48 would be radically different. This is a hinge moment. Right here, at this moment, everything would change. A lot of people think it changed in World War II. No, World War II, when it was over, Truman's goal was to go back as much as he could to the way it was before. And his thinking was, the way to do that is to show Stalin that we mean business, stop him in Greece, and we can go back to the way things were. It didn't happen at all. Everything would change. And it's really important to understand that every single person who's involved in foreign policy in the United States today. And that means everybody in the government today. When they were in school, when they learned about foreign affairs, they learned Truman Doctrine thinking. 
when they came out and had successful or went out and had, were successful in political science and diplom and international affairs, they came out thinking Truman Doctrine. Because think about what school does. You're listening to me right now. You're writing this down. You know I'll probably test you on this down the road. And you're thinking, how do I do well on the test? Well, I write about the Truman Doctrine. I explain what he says and try to add my own analysis. But you're rewarded by thinking what I'm thinking. You're being indoctrinated. Now, I try to tell you that, no, there's all kinds of things going on. That's kind of what goes on here. That's what went on for 70 years. Everybody's been taught this. So they came out in the world, walked into the government, into the State Department, said, this is the way the world is. And it continues and perpetuates. So here's Truman giving the speech for Turkey and Greece. Now, a doctrine. What is a doctrine? We've already had the Monroe Doctrine. And a doctrine um, is simply a statement of the president's foreign policy initiatives. It is not technically law. But since the president was, is the person who speaks for the United States in foreign affairs and the president negotiates treaties, this is gives the... or ha, um, this allows for the president to have great power. But a doctrine is a political statement. And once again, we're going to get to my oft-repeated statement. People say, I don't like politics. I just want politicians to solve problems. Solving the problems, acting on problems, is what we call politics. It's politics. And if you don't like pol politics, you're allowing somebody else to solve the problem. We are going through one of the most dramatic economic changes ever because of the coronavirus. This, this is something, I mean, we just canceled school for the, well, canceled, we didn't cancel school, but <laughs> no, that means you have to stay here. But we're not gonna open the schools again. We have to school this way. Can you think of anything more radical? We have almost 34 million people have lost their job. That's between um, one out of five people or not lost your job, apply for unemployment insurance. That's one out of five people applying for unemployment insurance. And they say it could be as many as 70 or 80% of, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, another maybe 20 million, 70, um, or that's only about 70% of the unemployed. So another 15 to 20 million might be unemployed. Sorry. I, <laughs> this is one of the things I have all these screens up because I have to make sure everything's working and something caught my eye. We're going through radical changes, and these are political decisions. And right now, there's a massive political backroom. Congress isn't meeting. Uh, I don't want to go into details of what's going on, but this is dramatic. This is politics. And you're like, if you say, ah, oh, hopefully they decide. Well, it's kind of being decided. In the vacuum, there are a small, tiny percentage of people in this economic disaster that seems to be happening that's scooping up all the wealth. Remember what I told you in the boom bust cycle, the big who survive get everything. Back to this set. So here's the main factors of the Truman Doctrine. The main factors. Number one, communism is different than other threats, as I mentioned before. It's ideological. It's a belief system. And so this is a threat of people's beliefs. So it's not that we're going to allow also everyone in the U.S. will speak Russian. It's that this rush, this evil ideology will come over and change people's minds and they'll be different. And if something in your mind changes, you still look the same. You still look like everybody else. And there's one more thing, it's indivisible. You've, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation, or the Pledge of Allegiance today, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Remember that was added in the 1920s. Now the United States of America, uh, <laughs> One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, one nation, indivisible. Indivisible means all together. By the way, I should add that under God, that came about in the Cold War. This was a big, major political exchange. We're not godless commies, and to prove it, we're going to make all our kids say that we're under God to show that we're not commies. But back to this. Indivisible means all together as one. You can't divide it. What that means is... One communist in Moscow is the same as a communist in Berlin, the same as a communist in Japan, the same as a communist in Wyoming. They're all the same. One is equal to the other. 
And therefore, it's implying that if we allow communism anywhere, they are all together like a, a um, they're all connected in a hive and they'll take people. And that's really a hive mentality. Gee, doesn't that sound like a lot of science fiction movies? Next, because of what Keenan called the domino effect, it can happen anywhere. The struggle could be anywhere. And what that means is if one country falls, its neighbors will fall like a domino. Now, a lot of times you see this as the, called the domino theory. Well, Keenan called it the domino effect. So we're going to call that right now. But eventually, by the 1950s, the domino theory. So let's get back to Greece. If we don't stop them in Greece, what's going to happen? It will jump across the Adriatic and Italy will fall. Then France will fall. And you see like then a row of dominoes going in all directions. Spain, Greece, or the rest of Germany, France, the lowlands, Britain. Like a row of dominoes. And what's next? That I guess a really big domino will cross the Atlantic. And boom, the United States is next. And you can see Wyoming at the end go. All like a row of dominoes. Yes, all roads lead to Wyoming. And so if we don't stop it in Greece, it will go everywhere. Same deal. If China falls to the communists, and remember, it's like this ideological threat takes over, boom, they fall. Then Korea, Japan, Wyoming, all like a row of dominoes. Next, that means the world is very simple. It's a bipolar world. There are two sides, the U.S. and the Soviets or allies of the U.S. versus allies of the Soviets, or that's, it's like allies of the U.S. against the Soviets. And boy, it's a really simple world. You're either with us or against us. So it's us versus them, good versus evil, the free world versus the slave world, the enslaved world. Have you ever heard the free world? That comes from this bipolar thinking. And what makes you free? You oppose the Soviets. Not anything you do in your country, just be opposed to the Soviets and you're with us. And so all these maps will come out in this era. And this is the way it was when I was a little kid. I remember looking at maps in like um, magazines. Magazines are things you used to buy and they would have like words and things in them. But it was always red and blue, always red and blue. This very simple world. And they always have the blue mass of these, the little guy, the US and the reds are coming to take us over. And so red, blue good versus evil and lastly every revolt every reform movement that might seem tied to communism every labor union remember labor unions were back, were called anarchists then communists and bolsheviks and reds all of their movement should everything if they want to change the current system anything that might change the system like for example asking for civil rights for African Americans or equal rights for women or providing health care for all Americans. Any reform movement, they look at it as that might undermine the existing state. And if you undermine the existing state, that will help the communists. And the thought was this was all directed from the Kremlin. So that's why that cartoon here is, here's Joseph Stalin, and there's supposed to be Molotov, his foreign minister, who's on the edge of being arrested and executed. His wife has already been arrested. Ah, the fun and good times in the Soviet Union. But these are supposed to be all countries, a little blurry. And it's basically Sam um, Stalin pointing at Greece saying, okay, here will be a revolt. And the next place will be Iran. And the best part about this is it's the spinning globe. And the idea was they would just spin the globe and wherever their finger landed on that globe, that's where they'll start a rebellion. The image that Truman and others talked about was they imagined Stalin with a big map of the world. And here he is popping his pipe, kind of walking around here as I walk off the screen and now I'm coming back in. And he said, today we will have a rebellion in Greece. Tomorrow, maybe Korea. Next we'll have a strikes in New York City or Paris. We had this vision that Stalin was directing this. So every revolt was actually directed by Stalin. So here's the main element of Truman Doctrine thinking. The main element. Every, or the main element of what Truman was saying. Sorry, I had to change the screen. If the United States wants to send weapons to Greece, we're not fighting Greek communists. We're fighting Stalin. 
if we want to send aid to the Chinese nationalist government fighting Mao Zedong, we're not fighting Mao Zedong and the Chinese communists, we're fighting Stalin. And it also means that anybody who wants a reform is potentially a spy. By the way, look at that right here. Doesn't that sound exactly like total war thinking? The Truman Doctrine brought total war thinking to the United States. And this is important. I did not type that in there, but please write that in. This is total war thinking to the United States when the United States is at peacetime. It's applying that anybody could be the enemy. In fact, I'm going to type that in so I don't forget. So once again, let's get back to the creative process that you get to watch. This is something I said in class, but without me uh, being there, it's harder to set that aside. That's why I want to type that in. Here's the amazing thing. It is implying what Truman said is, we are fighting to protect democracy against the tyranny of communism. Here's the interesting thing. You notice I did say that Turkey had a democracy. Well, a, a, a kind of a democracy. I never said great. Greece was a nasty, brutal military dictatorship that would last to the 1970s. Their secret police would round up any opposition. They would be tortured. Sometimes they would disappear, or using the terminology of the post-World War II era, disappeared, which is terrifying. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we want to support a nasty, brutal military dictatorship and what Truman said is, we're fighting to defend democracy. So it created a new precedent, a big change in American political thinking. What it said was, the US is going to abandon democracy. We, we said we're gonna fight democracy, but we're gonna abandon it to fight communism. And so that means the United States is going to support dictators. The U.S. will support dictators claiming we are defending democracy, claiming we are defending the forces of good, and yet the U.S. is going to start militarily aiding or um, by supporting dictators. And the vast majority of this aid will be military aid. Here is the U.S. dollar, and you notice this is the Mediterranean Patrol that's talking about Greece and Turkey and the Mediterranean, and it's with a rifle with a bayonet. And this will have severe effects on American foreign policy down the road. Credibility issues. We'll see these already happening in Latin America. Remember I talked about the United States supported dictators because we tried to because we want American businesses to dominate. I talked about Nicaragua and big stick diplomacy. But this will have great effect around the world now. This idea is being spread all around the world to stop communism. And so the U.S. will claim we're supporting dictators. And yet, what? or I'm sorry, the U.S. will claim they're supporting democracy, but in essence, we're going to support nasty military dictators. It won't be long after that the U.S. will start sending aid to Spain. Spain was a fascist country. Hundreds of thousands of Americans were killed or horrifically wounded to destroy fascism. And now the United States will start arming fascists under Frank, uh, Francisco Franco. And what would the justification be? They're not communists. The U.S. will support dictatorships and really nasty, brutal governments all across Asia and Africa soon afterwards. And, and then we already said Greece. In the Middle East, this will have severe effect. The U.S. will... Um, help undermine a budding democracy in Syria that just won their independence. We'll do the same thing in Iraq. We'll do the same thing in Jordan and Lebanon. And boy, will this have major implications in this place called Iran. And yes, all of this will have credibility issues down the road. Here's a great political cartoon of A to Turkey and Greece. And there, I love the picture of uh, Uncle Sam blindly going into the future. So this is actually more of an isolationist cartoon 
but it's a good one because it shows that the U.S. has no idea what's going, where it's going, no idea what's going on in the future. So good cartoon. And all of this will come about. We can see this coming from Yalta, Potsdam, the dropping of the atomic bomb. All these kind of things are leading up to the new Cold War. So the big shift where it will affect us to this very day would be the domestic politics that will come out of the Truman Doctrine. Truman laid out this apocalyptic vision that if we don't stop communism in Greece, we'll be defending the shores of Wyoming. And that's the only chance we have. And so he scared everyone to death. We must contain communists or we're under threat. And this, therefore, he greatly exaggerated the threat of communism. Greatly. Sorry, I'm having, I got to change something real quick. Greatly changed it. And that, this is a pamphlet that was sent out. Um, you would not believe the different groups all of a sudden that would start sending out pamphlets. Most of them are funded by business. Think about it. business leaders don't want this idea of workers having more control of communist, uh, more control of capital. And also arms manufacturers all of a sudden are like, oh, we can make a lot of money if people are scared of communists. So look at this, is this tomorrow? And this actually would become a movie, uh, they would make a movie about this, which is hilariously bad, but terrifying. That the communists are coming and you can't fight back. But if we don't contain communism, we're doomed. And once he laid that out, he can't go back tomorrow and say, by the way, we must be scared about Greece. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Because if something else happens in another country, like Iran, or let me throw one out here, South Korea, this new country that's being created out of the Cold War. If we don't stop it there, he will be accused of being, and here's the term, soft on communism. And after the Truman Doctrine, everybody was so riled up that no politician can afford to look soft on communism. If you're not willing to stand up to communism in every single location where it might win, then you're making the United States weak. Truman set the stage for this fear of looking soft on communism. And think about how that's going to taint politics from then, that moment to this very day. Think about how it will change it. That means every politician, if they say, we've exaggerated the communist threat, the communist threat is not enough, their opponents will say, look, they're soft on communism. They're going to let the communists win, or maybe they want the communists to win. Remember the issues of the Truman Doctrine. Go back and look at this. It's an ideological threat, and maybe the communists are winning because it's entering their mind. It's this ideological threat. So it became very easy to say that those who are soft on communism, they're actually perhaps traitors. In fact, they'll say politicians who are soft on communism, maybe they're not full reds, but they're pink. Thus the term pinko will be used all the time that they're soft on communism. Now, think about how that works after the Cold War ended. Well, after the Cold War ended, there was actually a crisis. Who will be the enemy? Well, for much of your life, if you go back to the Truman Doctrine and look at right here, communism ideological and all these issues, uh, yeah, I put in um, the dominant effect of communist spreading, a bipolar polar world between the free world and the communist world, and every reform directed by the Kremlin. All you have to do is take out communism and put in terrorism, and you have the same thing. One of the most amazing things in my lifetime, and it's it, um, <laughs> you're the first one of the first classes where it really wasn't in yours, but right before the September 11th, September 11th, 2001 attack. The, the Bush administration in 2001, so President George W. Bush was president. Did I just say President George? The redundancy award for redundancy. President Bush and his administration, they were ignoring the threat of small little communist groups that they were warned about, groups like Al-Qaeda. They completely ignored them and were literally caught with their pants down. But they were making 
trying to make China, Jesus, I sound like President Trump there. They're trying to make China into the threat. And there was actually a few confrontations with China. They were trying to put, okay, communism is out, China. And you still see people trying to make that China threat today. It's amazing when the, the clear issues of now a much weaker Russia getting involved in US politics in, in the 2016 election. And all of a sudden you could just throw Russia into this. Oh my God, Russia's doing this. And, and everybody who disagrees with me must be a, a Russian. I, I will look on, on Twitter for political news. There's a few uh, political and historical writers. I like what they say. But you would not believe how people are talking about this is all you know Russia. They just add that thinking today. It, it's mind boggling. So no one can look soft on communism. No one can look soft on terrorism. No one can look soft on Russia. Look soft on China. That thinking goes on. And it's really hard to have the guts to stand up to this. Because what if they win? What if the communists do win in a country? What if you're the person in charge and the communists win? I can't begin to tell you what a big deal that became. What if? And so every politician tried to look tough on communism. Well, by trying to make to look tough on communism, that has a lot of baggage. And this became known as red baiting. Attacking your opponent as being soft on communism. Red baiting. And this would be an attack on the Democrats more than any other party. Why the Democrats? Because there has been a Democratic president since 1932. It was Democrats at Yalta. And immediately, this is where the Yalta was like Munich, giving in to the communists. Roosevelt allowed the communists to win. Maybe the Democrats are pinkos or worse, which implies if you're a pinko, you're a traitor. And even though I said Republicans won the midterm election in 46, that would be an aberration. Democrats would control the House of Representatives all the way to the 1990s. And so the Democrats would be attacked any time there seemed to be a victory by the communists, the Soviets. It's the Democrats' fault. And Democrats, they never handled this well. They basically just said, you're right. <laughs> we are soft. And we see it to this day. And there's no coincidence that out of this thinking that everybody must look tough on communism and there might be an enemy within would lead to the second Red Scare, which we'll talk about to, uh, tomorrow, McCarthyism. So what's going to happen is one way to prove you're tough on communism, spend on the military. The United States did everything they could to cut back on military spending as fast as they could cut back on military spending. But beginning with the Truman Doctrine, if we got to contain communists everywhere, we need to spend more on the military. And this would begin a massive peacetime military buildup that would all happen out of this. And here's the domino theory. Once Laos goes, all will go. This is actually from 1961. And here's the strange thinking of Stalin. Stalin looking at this, here we're all together in 44 to defeat fascism, and now he's public enemy number one. How it happened so amazingly fast. But I should add, thinking of the Cold War, Cold War thinking about fear of communism, it merges, it, there's an um, overlap between the total war thinking, we must be all together to win the war in World War II, and that thinking did not go away in the, in the late 1940s to the Red Scare. We must get, um, people already have that thinking in their head, oh, things are better, oh no, there's another enemy. And it just turned on again. It's no coincidence. And we have been in a state of low scale total war and some high scale in our lifetime since 1948. And so look how this works. A couple just amazing documents. This wonderful for treason is John Kennedy, a man who, as president, would initiate the biggest peacetime military buildup in history up to that time. And yet, because he also talked about um, perhaps some kind of negotiation with the Soviet Union and 
understanding that we can't get everything we want, i.e. we can't just drive a uh, sympathetic government to communism out of Cuba. This was passed all over as the President of the United States wanted for treason. I should add, this was passed out one November day in 1963 in Dallas, Texas. This was all over and posted on light post all along the route that John Kennedy would take on its way to what's called the trademark to give a speech. He would be assassinated. And this is by, now, I should add this opposition, this is very conservative, right-wing opposition. And here is a book from 1965, how the Beatles were involved in spreading communism by hypnotizing the people. I mean, yeah, first off, look at their hair. And I should add, since I've not been able to get a haircut, I'm starting to get that Beatles mop top. But secondly, have you heard uh, I, I Want to Hold Your Hand or A Hard Day's Night? Communism. All right. But that gives you an idea how insidious this fear of looking for communists. And then we'll see it. This It doesn't go away. So a couple things we must get to. And the first thing is, Coinciding with the Truman Doctrine would be what's called the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan would be, you know, I did not set this up very well, but let me type this in. This is another one. If I was in class, I would just simply tell you, but I'm going to move this up so we get this right. Isn't this exciting? You get to watch this. You get to watch how my computer froze because I got too many things going on. I know. It's, it's like you're part of a new world. I have no idea what I type. But this is the economic rebuilding of Western Europe. Some people will say it's also part of China, even though the U.S. would help China rebuild. Okay, so back to the... Sorry about that. So this is the rebuilding of Western Europe. And here's the issue before we get to it. The realization was that Western Europe was in absolute shambles. Here is... Um, that right there are the streets of, that's in the Western occupation zones of Berlin. Here is in London. It's still rubble. The economies were in shambles. People were starving. And the realization hit, and I've told you this before, starving people revolt. It's starving people. And if people don't have food, that's when they revolt. <laughs> I, I just couldn't help it. I, I, I thought about today. When you have this many unemployment people and worried about if they're going to be able to feed their family, that's when they do things like revolt. I mean, this is a real issue that's happening potentially right now. Have a good day. Oh, back to this. And so the realization was the U.S. is going to have to help Europe rebuild to get a jump start on the occupation zone. And what happened was when the cult, with the Truman Doctrine... Roosevelt, or I'm sorry, Truman changed his Secretary of State to George Marshall right here. Marshall, as you might remember, was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of World War II, a five-star general, would retire, and Truman brought him back because Marshall was a symbol of stability, of victory, and was kind of an impeachable force. You could not say that Marshall was not pro-American. He was a five-star general. Now, you, all of you should be going, yeah, right. No, of course. Rabbit right-wing, rabbit um, anti-communist right-wingers would soon be calling Dwight Eisenhower a pinko. It's unbelievable how this is going to happen to this day. But what they said was this. Truman said, to make sure that the communists do not take over Western Europe, we need $48 billion over three years. And Marshall would give a speech as Secretary of State laying this out. Now, they never got $48 billion, they got $12 billion. 
Why? Because he wanted about 15. And so this is how you negotiate. You ask for significantly more than what you want, and then you negotiate down to a compromise figure. $12 billion over three years that would be given to Western Europe, just given in Marshall Plan A. In fact, it was called the economic, the European Economic Recovery Act. But everyone calls it the Marshall Plan to help rebuild Western Europe. And this would be one of the most successful plans of that era. The realization was, and this fits in more with Keenan's original idea, if we show that the Western system is better, people will not revolt. People who know that their jobs are secure, that their paychecks are secure, that they can feed and provide for their families and have a safe retirement are less likely to revolt. If you're insecure about your job, if you're insecure about caring for your family and you're insecure about your retirement, that's when, that is when other types of governments can come in. And they're not just fearful of communism. They're also fearful of the fascists coming back. Because if people are insecure, you can lead to fascism or Stalinism. That's what they feared. So $12 billion. They offered it to Stalin, but they said, you must allow for free elections, knowing that Stalin would never go for it. So it was humanitarian to help people, but it was also anti-communist. This kept communists out. But here's the biggie, the kicker. There was thought, we're spending $12 billion. Oh, that's US taxpayer money that just we're throwing away. No, that is not how government spending works. They spent $12 billion over three years in, in Europe. The vast majority of that $12 million would be spent on US goods to rebuild Europe. And so that meant that U.S. or um, this would increase U.S. economic growth after the war, which needed it, and this would be a boon for U.S. markets. This was an economic program for Western Europe and the United States. Government spending does not work, at least <laughs> government spending if done correctly. I know, I know, but does not work like personal expenditures. If the um, if government spends money, if you only look at it as, oh, you raised taxes or borrowed money, that's a debt for government. No. Government spending becomes an asset for people. Government debt is actually an asset for somebody else. If the government borrows $12 billion to rebuild the economy, that means that's a credit. That's more money for, 12 million, uh, for the United States. That's $12 billion poured into the economy. If you or I go into debt, it doesn't quite work that way. But for government, their debts are assets for somebody else. It's actually even more than that, more than what I'm talking about. And so here is a little girl in Paris with a, a balloons for Marshall Plan Aid. Okay, I really like that one. And here shows, we're not going to know the actual amounts, but you see the... Um, the size of the red lines, that is the amount of Marshall Plan aid that went all through Western Europe. And you notice most of it went to the countries uh, like Britain, of course, but also France and the occupation zones of Germany and Italy. One of the first times in history, this is a big change from previous economic positions. The United States, the victor in World War II, is going to help their enemies rebuild so they don't go to war again. Remember, after Versailles, the US, imposed, the US was part of the Treaty of Versailles to impose reparations. Now we're helping rebuild. And this will help solidify American, the American standing in the Western world. It's a radical shift. I should add, I've talked about conservative and liberal foreign policy. The Marshall Plan is, and put this down, a definition of liberal foreign policy. This is liberal. The, the idea that if we help our allies in other places in the world, if we help them improve economically and make their government stronger and the people more secure, not only will this help the United States markets, but this will help American security. If we have more 
countries in the world that are economically secure, they are less of a threat to the United States. So that is one thing. Now, remember what I also told you that a lot of the aid would be military. That would be a conservative response. We don't want to mess with it. We're just going to improve it so you can stick, stay in power. And that's all we care about. So here's a little bit of Europe trying to get the self-support. And here's the American taxpayer saying, keep pumping. And here is a great cartoon showing Marshall Plan aid, all expanding Europe, but behind the Iron Curtain, here is Stalin's plan of enslavement of the people. And you notice the plow is the hammer and sickle. That's actually a really good cartoon. Where are we at here? And so, we're not going to get the National Security Act today. We will. Oh, will we ever. But let's get to this. Last thing for today. As you can see from these happy, and these are, I, I want to show you a picture of the cool kids. These are the cool kids when I was in school. So we got the bike. You notice the tri-wheels? Look at that thing. Isn't that like the coolest bike ever? He's got, now he's a little bit advanced. He's got a bicycle. But look at that tri-wheel. That is awesome. So think about how this has changed politics. I want you to think about what this also could mean too. Whenever I show happy kids from the past, it can only mean one thing. A quick practice thesis. Evaluate the following statement. The cold, not was, ah! Now I gotta change everything. Everything has been ruined. Don't look at, don't look, don't look. Okay. The Cold War dramatically changed domestic politics after 1947. So, quick, on the United States, the Cold War dramatically changed domestic politics. Quick, write a thesis statement. I'll give you a couple minutes. Take a, uh, make, get the main position about the Cold War. You must address Cold War and politics. And, so politics must be in there, but the Cold War. And... You must also then take a position and then A and B. So we're writing a four paragraph essay. Two minutes, go. Same deal. If you um, send it to me, in the message, I'll look at your thesis statement. The cold was. Ha! By the way, you like my cartoon? Uh, that's a Marshall Plan cartoon behind, a transparent behind. Uh, Stalin leading all the people of the East. And they're showing, oh, look how great the Marshall Plan is. Look at the great dress. And all the countries are going, ah, I want that. Clever cartoon. Okay, it should be just about finishing up. This is a relatively easy one. So, change domestic politics. Uh, let's, uh, I'll give you my quick version of it. The Truman Doctrine thinking in the Cold War era would forever change domestic politics because of the fear of communist expansion would lead to a massive, because of fear of communist expansion would lead to a massive military buildup and politicians afraid to look soft on communism kept fear of Soviet expansion in the forefront. And so, that is my thesis statement. And so I'm going to tie everything together with Truman Doctrine thinking. Uh, in my opening paragraph for context, I would use uh, Turkey and Greece, ending of the Cold War, maybe even bring up Yalta and Potsdam. So that would be context of the post-war world. And then um, throughout it all, I would, tie, I would have 
I would have elements of the Truman Doctrine in both the peacetime military buildup in my second paragraph and the Truman Doctrine in the, um, pol the politicians change because they're fearful of lo uh, looking soft on communism. And my guess is you probably had something pretty close to that. You could have mentioned as seen in one could have been the Truman Doctrine and the other one could have been a military buildup uh, or that. And we didn't get to it because I just want to make sure I got this in, but the National Security Act, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Well, I'm, I'm going to mention it today. But, or the Marshall Plan could have worked. Uh, more conservative economics versus liberal economics. We were mostly conservative foreign policy too. Oh, this is all liberal economics then at that time for the United States. Yeah, that'd be a pretty good... One, and you know, you might be thinking, wait a second, the DBQ won't be about this. Well, if it's not about the atomic bomb in 45, it's Cold War. But secondly, we're just practicing writing thesis statements. And so with that, let me get to one more thing then. Yeah, one more thing really quick then. Let's just start this really quick. And if you have any questions on the thesis statement, or you watch this down the, uh, down the road, I know a lot of people... I mean, by my number of views, I'm getting more people than are in this class watching the videos. So I'm, my guess is people are just coming back again. But if you want me to look at it, message me and I'll get it. So let's get to one more thing really quick. If we're going to have a situation where we're going to have to stop communism everywhere, and we're going to have a situation where we are now committing ourselves militarily and economic to Europe, and this idea that communism could be everywhere. That means we're gonna to have to change our entire peacetime government to a constant quasi wartime footing. And the act, and there is President Truman signing it, will be the National Security Act. And so the last couple of things for today, I just wanted to get uh, start this. And what it did is it created one Department of Defense. Before 1947, there was a Department of the Navy and a Department of the uh, Department of War, and they combined those two into one body, thinking this will coordinate defense, coordinate national security. Now that did not happen. You just now created instead of um, two huge departments, you create one massive department with many tentacles getting everywhere, and in the process. It created then a separate Army, Navy, and a brand new U.S. Air Force. Now, if you know anything about what happened there, there's actually going to be a Secretary of Defense, and then a separate Secretary of the Army, Secretary of Navy, Secretary of Air Force. So they kind of had it created, instead of two separate monsters, a three-headed giant monster. But they did have the biggest building in the world, the Pentagon. Next, we're going to have to know if there are commies. We're going to have to know if governments are undermining, being undermined by Stalinist expansion. And so we need spies. And it created two massive intelligence gathering apparatus. The first one is the Central Intelligence Agency. These are the spies. These are the ones committing espionage. And it came out of the group called the Office of Strategic strategic services, which coordinated intelligence for the military in World War II. And they took the remnants of that and created this brand new spy agency. And this is a big shift. The United States has avoided this because they knew the history of monarchs and all across Europe using secret spies to search. Yeah, sure, look into other countries but also to start spying on their own people. And you have apparatus like this, they have justification to exaggerate intelligence to go to war. That makes them more credible. Also, another group called the NSA or the National Security Agency. And these would become the two largest spy agencies in the United States. The CIA technically, this is espionage, that means people on the ground gathering information in other countries. And by law, they could not commit sabotage. And that includes things like actually attacking other countries or even assassination. That's gone now. But the idea was 
that the CIA would not be involved in operations that could get the United States involved in war. Now the CIA assassinates people all the time. It's actually quite shocking. The National Security Agency gathers intelligence. And this massive intelligence gathering apparatus that will gather intelligence all around the world. And now, both of them, and put little like a brackets or something, by law, these are supposed to operate outside the borders of the United States. They cannot operate inside the borders of the United States unless they have evidence that somebody within the borders of the U.S. is contacting somebody outside the U.S. But they can only operate outside the borders of the U.S. And so this was to gather information about other countries, potential operations and spies. But that set up a vacuum that would be filled by another brand new organization created in the 1930s called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And they will do domestic spying. Domestic spying. And last thing for today, all of these national security groups from the State Department, Secretary of Defense, to the head of the CIA, head of the FBI, all these different groups will come together to advise the president in what became known as the National Security Council. And the president would appoint a very specific person that would be the national security advisor to coordinate all of this information. And so this includes everything from potential military threats to pandemics. In fact, um, until last year, there was a part of the National Security Council that sole role was to look for potential pandemics. President Trump got rid of that. That's what we call amazing timing. And the National Security Council or the advisor will always be putting um, foreign policy threats, all these national security threats, into documents that the president would give. And yes, that happened here. The pandemic was a national security threat. And President Trump was warned from um, December, January, and February into March that this was going to be a massive threat that was ignored. And that's part of the reason we're in the situation we're in right now. But that's what they do. This was all created here. And that is where I end. All right, so tomorrow I'll pick this up. We'll do another practice thesis. Please, I'm not giving you any additional homework right now, except for that DBQ. Yes, I know it's big, but it's only four paragraphs. What's four paragraphs? But also then uh, that review packet. Keep going through that review packet. Not only is that going to be worth 400 points, the DBQs were 200. 400 points. It will help you immensely. Have that out. Boom, you can start writing. Oh. One more thing, or two more things. First off, if you plan on typing your DBQ for the AP exam, type it. If you plan on writing it, write it and take pictures. Do what you plan on doing. Try to time it so you take about 45 minutes. And the closing paragraph is the least important paragraph. Make sure you get the other ones. The other, your opening and two body paragraphs. Next, if you take a picture, do not submit to me or the college board, but to me, pictures on its side. <laughs> for notes or for, you know, for a few sentences, I can read it, I gotta turn my head, but please rotate them so the top is top, so it's in profile. Please rotate them before you turn it in. Now I might be um, thinking, well, why can't I rotate them? In Teams, it won't let me rotate. It won't let me do it. And if I get it, if I got to um, take all the time then to transfer it and do a bunch of stuff, which takes a minute, and I got 100 to grade, um, that will really take into my time and I'll be annoyed. And so I'm just not going to accept it. I will send you a note. You got to turn it in again. Resubmit it. Secondly, in the or, and, and for the college board, same thing. You know, don't put them in a the position. They're going to grade hundreds. They don't want to be, oh, oh God, God, here's one on its side. I got to turn it. Because then they already, they're mad at you. And then that might affect your grade. All right. If there's no more questions, if there's no questions at all, I am done. I will see you tomorrow.